THE OBLIVIOUS GODS WHAT IS THE MEANING OF LIFE? TO LEARN Charles A. Yost, NASA Engineer Why pray? Have you ever prayed? If so, why? What was the meaning of your prayer? When most people pray, they are either asking for something or expressing gratitude for something. In each case, the person is, in essence, attempting to communicate with a greater being. And yet, when we look at this phenomenon in detail, there is a problem. If there is a greater being, great enough for you to spend time praying to, then that being is great enough to already understand all the variables of your situation. Therefore, that being's wise plan is already in place. So what is the need for and impact of your prayer? This logic may make prayer seem completely futile, and yet for millions of people around the world, prayer seems to work. How can this be? There is only one answer. Prayer often works because you are that greater being. You are required to make it work. You are within the universe. That means you possess the qualities of the universe, and the universe possesses the qualities of you. If you are conscious, then the universe is conscious. The philosopher Alan Watts said, quote, Through our eyes, the universe is perceiving itself. Through our ears, the universe is listening to its harmonies. We are the witnesses through which the universe becomes conscious of its glory, of its magnificence." End quote. As a living, dynamic part of the universe, you are solely and squarely in charge of your destiny. Nonetheless, it seems stressful, unwanted situations plague us all the time. You are certainly incapable of doing whatever you want. You cannot bring the dead back to life, or hit a jackpot every time at the casino, so how can you be God? It's very simple. You must accurately define God. Doing so means grasping a revolutionary concept. God is not all-powerful. For you, God is only as powerful as you are. There is nothing in human experience to suggest that anything in the universe is all-powerful. In fact, it is not even necessary for God to be all-powerful. Humans invented this childish idea like dogs staring longingly at their omnipotent owner, hoping for a scrap from the dinner table. But it is unrealistic. It is easy to thank God when things are going well and curse God when they are not. In the end, we mutter, Oh well, the Lord works in mysterious ways. That is how we placate ourselves, but it is simply untrue. With God, all things are possible, but some things are highly, highly, highly improbable. At first, it seems extremely depressing and deflating to think about the concept that God is not an all-powerful genie ready to grant your wishes. But this is like overcoming the honeymoon period of a romantic relationship. Let's look at the good, realistic part. The power of God is more than enough to give you an awesome life, a far better life than the one you currently have. Now, you will die, hence the limitation. But in the meantime, you can take your life to truly fantastic new levels. You can do this by understanding the actual power of God and how to make it work for you. God is an old process. But where exactly do you fit in? Let us look at animals. The main difference between you and an animal is self-awareness. There are mountains of scientific data to support biological evolution, survival of the fittest. The amazing, almost unimaginable tree of life behind us is filled with creatures that possess wondrous skills. 
and yet it seems we humans have this unique sense of full self-awareness. We look into a mirror and understand completely what is happening. Some animals, like apes and dolphins, are gaining ground too. This strange phenomenon gives us insight into the advancement of the spirit. But truly, what is self-awareness? Self-awareness is, simply enough, an acknowledgment of the self. So if that understanding separates us from lower creatures on the food chain, where is this leading? In other words, if self-awareness is the thing that defines human significance compared to other known species, what is the next step? What happens if we become even more self-aware? Once a being is self-aware, how does that being become more self-aware? The God we have referenced throughout history appears to be an absolute self-aware consciousness. But how do we evolve to get closer? Attention is the refined focus of self-awareness. Attention is the key to directing your power. To what do you pay attention, second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour? Where is your mind? Are you filling it with content from the minds of others? Or are you looking with fresh eyes and creating something positive? As Henry Ford said, quote, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right, End quote. You are either master of mind or mastered by mind. Your attention is up against the attention of everyone else on the planet. Each day you are bombarded by distractions designed to keep you in a submissive position, simply working your job paying your taxes, and shifting wealth upward to those who will gladly reap the fruits of what you sow. When you walk into a shopping mall, you are a rat that has stepped into a scientific experiment. Psychologists have been hired to find out what will most likely make you turn right or left or look up or down. They know what colors will draw your eyes and how to orient the aisles so you will stay the longest. In fact, modern science has created quite a fascinating monster. Ironically, we as a society do not condone scientists subjecting us to physical experimentation. However, when scientists use their skills to help corporations manipulate our behavior, those scientists are rewarded profusely. Now let me stress, I am not saying that scientists should be restricted from working on such projects in a free, capitalistic society. I am only pointing out the existence of this system, so you can become more aware of its influence. Most of the advertising around you is there to simply inspire you to buy, buy, buy. The rest is to make you obey. In this chaotic world, filled with billions of desperate minds scrambling to control yours, you must stay focused on the things that are truly good for you and your world. This is the great challenge, and this is what you must practice every single day of your life. Unfortunately, there are no vacations. Because you are surrounded by advertising campaigns each day, the best way to combat them is by surrounding yourself with your own personal custom-made advertising campaign. Take note cards and jot something very simple on them to capture the essence of what you want your mind to create. Place them around your house so you'll see them each day. But how should you word what is on those cards? Let us take a look at what has worked for thousands of years. Well over two billion people consider themselves Christians. This makes Christianity the world's largest religion. Therefore, let's look at the modern King James Version of the Bible and see what it says about you. In the book of John, 
Jesus is in Jerusalem when he is approached by a group of men who are prepared to stone him to death. Jesus says he has done many good works and asks why they want to stone him. The men tell Jesus they are not going to stone him for his good works, but for blasphemy, because he, being a man, claims to be God. Jesus' reply to them is profound. Quote, is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? End quote. John 10.34 Here, Jesus therefore proclaims that humans are gods. He further goes on to state, quote, The Father is in me, and I in him. End quote. John 10.38 God is portrayed as a harsher deity in the Old Testament, but that's because the writers then were even less advanced and understood even less about interpreting his personality and motives. And yet the words of Jesus echo those in the Old Testament. Quote, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. End quote. Psalm 82.6 in fact, there are numerous biblical references to gods in plural, such as, quote, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods, end quote. Psalm 82, 1. And this startling statement from the very first chapter of the Bible about the creation of humans, quote, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. End quote. Genesis 1.26 But if the Old and New Testaments of the Bible are rife with plural references to gods, who is this central figure called God, or the Father, throughout the book? Perhaps the most dramatic direct meeting between a human and God was Moses' encounter with the burning bush. As Moses tended a flock of sheep in the wilderness, he saw a strange burning bush that was not consumed by the fire. Quote, and God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And God said, Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I will be with you. And then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. That's Exodus chapter 3. But what does that mean, I am that I am? It means that God himself is equal to his name. God is known as the Creator. Therefore, every time you invoke his name, you are creating something. If you say, I am sick, you are creating sickness for yourself. If you say, I am broke, you are creating poverty for yourself. But if you say, I am happy, you are creating happiness. And if you say, I am wealthy, you are creating wealth. Regardless of how literally true this account is from the Bible, considering all of the book has been retranslated for thousands of years, the gist of the story is clear. God, once again, is reiterating the intimate relationship between you and him, you and God, 
are inseparable. I can say you are human. I can equally say you are God, a creator. Because of this, you are creating every single day. In fact, you have no choice. Every thought that radiates from your head is on the path to realizing itself. Therefore, you must be very, very careful in considering what you want to create. You are here to learn how to tame this wild process. Fortunately, thoughts do not instantly materialize. The good news is that this is why someone doesn't drop dead just because you mutter it in anger. The bad news is that this is also why you can't necessarily manifest a jackpot at the casino when the wheels roll. In order for thoughts to manifest, you must focus your attention on the same thing over and over, every day, in a clear, specific way. This repetition over time is what reinforces each thought with the next and eventually builds them into a force that bends reality to your vision and desires. It requires patience and dedication, but layer by layer your thoughts can make astounding things happen in days, weeks, or years, depending on the magnitude of the goal. However, you must believe entirely and unquestionably in your power to make it happen. Jesus said, quote, If ye have faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it would move, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. End quote. But he did not say it would move overnight. Dedication to faith is the key. When you emerged from the womb, this vast, mind-boggling world was already here. You did not make it, and yet it existed. Something made it. Something focused its masterful attention here. That something seems so much greater than you. However, you are on the path to advance and become as great as it. You are it. Your part is just not as self-aware yet. The more self-aware you become, the more you will be able to tap into your creative power. Everything in the universe is growing, moving, and alive. Whether we look at the wide scope of galaxies light years away, or within the tiniest spaces of your body's cells, molecules, and atoms, we see the same things. We see objects swirling and orbiting around each other, vibrating with the resonance of the cosmos. There are only two options in the universe, stillness or motion. God moves because stillness is nothingness. In my opinion, all things that are moving, vibrating at those tiny atomic levels, rocks, leaves, flowing water, are therefore alive and conscious to some extent, imbued with a resonating piece of the God energy also on their long path to self-awareness. We are part of a cosmic heartbeat, cycles within cycles, perpetually wobbling for balance against the entropy that will some distant day smash us all back together again to start anew. We are all made of the same stuff. Many wonder, from where did God come? But this is a very crude question. It implies that everything must come from somewhere. But why is that? Is it not simply possible that God has always been and will always be? To say, from where does God come, requires us to look back in time. However, time is an illusion. It is a flexible thing that varies from person to person, from condition to condition and from point of view to point of view. For example, the existence of the past and future depends on the existence of the present to separate the two. However, what is the present? How long does it last? A second? 
Well, that is impossible, because even a second has a beginning and an end. That would mean we have a past and future within our past and future, and this simply does not make sense. We are only reducing the problem down more and more on an infinite scale. We could never come up with a measurement for the present that does not contain a past and future within it. Therefore, it is an illusion based on a particular individual's opinion. You exist as an extension within the mind of this thing called God, and you are unique. Even identical twins, clones with the same DNA, have different tastes and live different lives. Their souls, or conscious self-awareness, are unique. And we are all unique creators. Only humans can create humans. The cells from your body are passed along to create new generations as the old ones die. And yet the entire mass of humanity exists within this single entity we call the universe, our collective God. It is now time for us to take a more advanced look at God and understand God as something that unites us all instead of separating us. I know mystics in the Caribbean who believe that if you were capable of actually understanding God, your mind would explode. But what exactly is this universe, this God in which the known world exists? One startling answer may rest on what is known as membrane theory. Isaac Newton's law of gravity aptly predicts the way a basketball behaves on the court or a rocket behaves in space. However, his laws do not apply when we look at the extremely small world, the quantum level, or the extremely big world, the observable universe at large. The problem in looking at the big world is quite fascinating. Scientists have an equation to explain the relationship between the amount of matter in a space and how it should interact. But there is not enough matter in the known universe to explain the behavior of the cosmos according to Newton's ideas alone. In order to compensate for this, scientists have long theorized about some dark matter that may exist. In doing so, they are simply trying to fill the gaps in their theory with a phantom, something that is paradoxically defined by its very lack of definition. An alternative theory, membrane theory, suggests our universe is simply a drop in an ocean of universes, and things here are held in order by the gravitational impact of the matter in those adjoining universes as well. It surmises that, once in a while, two universes slam into each other, creating Big Bangs. Now, as is the case with all scientific theories, this one is under constant revision, and we may never be capable of knowing any truth scientifically, since all science is the product of human experience. However, the notion of this presents a fascinating possibility. As people become more and more self-aware and enlightened, as we develop the third eye and transition to higher states of self-discovery, is it possible that some day, far into the future, each time a person's mind actually attains full, true, self-awareness and enlightenment, that person's mind will literally explode into a new big bang? Yes, it is possible. Maybe the universe we are all living within is the universe that was created by one entity's mind almost 14 billion years ago when he or she or it attained enlightenment. At that moment, this entity, God, mentally and physically gave birth to all we see or know. We 
are within God, and God is within us. You are living within the mind of a being who attained nirvana. The point is for you to become self-aware enough to master the art of creation, to obtain enlightenment, and produce your own Big Bang. Why? Because you must create something. And if you do not create life for yourself, then you will create death for yourself. Your powers will be used to self-destruct. It is spiritual survival of the fittest among gods. Our universe exists because an entity, long ago, chose existence to oblivion, chose life over death, chose to create instead of destroy. That choice is now in your hands as well. There is no right or wrong, just a choice. Whether among animals or gods, survival of the fittest is a selfish thing. There is nothing wrong with selfishness. In fact, selfishness is required in order to survive. It is how selfishness is attained that determines good versus evil. Evil is attaining your selfish goals without regard for the welfare of others. Good is attaining your selfish goals with high regard for the welfare of others. Both options are on the table, but good is the one that works in the long term and will make your life easier and better. Now, how exactly is this? The Buddha said you cannot be an island of happiness within an ocean of misery. What is good for all is good for you. It is easy to live in a capitalistic society that values the ego and forget your fellow humans, no matter how downtrodden they may be. But to allow the weak, hungry, and poor to go unaided is like allowing a fire to burn free in your neighborhood so long as it's not near your house. Well, eventually it may spread, and it may burn down your house as well. If we allow the sick to roam untreated, they will eventually spread their diseases to you as well. No matter how well you have cultivated your life and prepared your home, if society breaks down, the hordes will invade your property and take what you have. You may be able to defend it for a while, but not forever. The goal is to prevent this from happening. If you choose to self-destruct, then be concise and do so quickly. But if you choose to grow, to learn, to enjoy life and its pleasures, then start learning to create positive energy this very moment, right now. It is not easy, since constant distractions will pull you away, but you must practice. You must visualize what you want to create on a daily basis. And if you are lacking in imagination, use whatever tools you have at your disposal. Draw or print out pictures and place them around in places you will often encounter, reminding you of your goal. Make them simple and vivid, and your mind will begin to create and attract what you need. You might put, quote, I am able to pay my bills with ease, or, quote, I am healthy, or, quote, I am attractive, etc. Faith has become a word bogged down with too much abuse and baggage. Instead, belief is the key. Believe you will create what you want, no matter how incredible it may seem. But to simply wish is not enough. Faith or belief without action is dead. You must also stay busy, working toward your goals. As the old adage goes, God helps those who help themselves. But just as important is how you share your good fortunes and give back. It sometimes seems hard to come by a dollar in our society. 
Therefore, when one has money or resources, it may feel counterintuitive to give some of that away. However, giving to others takes on a mystical quality. Money, in particular, does not truly exist in some tangible way. Whether you value a dollar bill or a gold coin, neither will nourish you if you're lost in the desert. What we call money today is simply a reflection of energy. Whatever we humans decide is worthwhile. When you give a portion of your good fortune to charities, even anonymously, it doesn't matter what happens to your money. What matters is the good flow that will come back to you, bringing more cosmic generosity toward you as well. This may seem like spiritual mumbo-jumbo, but never forget that proven law of physics. For every action, there is an opposite but equal reaction. This also applies to the energy of your mind. This is why so many wealthy people stress being charitable. In many cases, the charity they showed others on the way up the economic ladder is what resulted in goodwill toward them and their eventual wealth. Give, and you will be given to as well. Keep in mind, when placing positive reminders around you, you don't necessarily have to use note cards, since others can read them and undermine your privacy. You can also use symbols that have meaning to you, but not to others. It is not always good to let others know what you are focusing on for yourself. Unfortunately, people who doubt your methods, are jealous, or simply negative, can project their destructive thoughts toward you, giving your thought waves even more resistance to overcome. So regardless of whether you post your affirmations plainly or secretly, stay focused on them. If you do that, and are charitable to others when good fortune blooms, your soul will expand, your vibration will rise, and you will spiritually evolve. Once you have proven this simple method to yourself, you will be able to teach others as well. It works.